Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation. We are um, going to be learning about the history of the Great New York State Fair from Susan Millett, who is the town historian for Town of Geddes. Take it away. Hi, everyone. The first state fair in the country was the New York State Fair, and it was held in Syracuse in 1841. It was based on the concept of English agricultural fairs. The state legislature gave $8,000 in 1941 for the promotion of an agricultural and household manufacturers in the state through an annual traveling fair. The village of Syracuse was considered the center of farming interest in New York and was selected for the first two day event. It was held on September 29th and 30th, 1841. The fair was held where North Salina, Division, Townsend, and Ash Streets are today. For the next 50 years, the fair was a traveling event. The fair was held in Syracuse a total of three times at different locations before finally being located in the town of Gaddis in 1890. Syracuse had a population of 11,000 people during the first state fair. Syracuse was selected because it was centralized in the state and had the Erie Canal, railroad lines, and a network of toll roads and turnpikes. Packet boats were just one of the many ways people could get to the state fair. James Gaddis, a descendant of one of the early developers of the Erie Canal, downtown Syracuse, and the salt industry, must be given major credit for bringing the permanent fair to Syracuse. A 100 acre tract of pasture land of the Smith and Powell farm was purchased for $30,000. It was picked because of its location close to downtown Syracuse, the Erie Canal and the New York Central tracks. Here is a drawing of the 1850 State Fair that was held in Albany. The Albany Fair that was held there nine years later in 1859. The newly chartered city of Syracuse, as it was when the 1849 fair was held on James Street Hill. Onondaga Lake can be seen in the background. The Floral Hall was the center of attraction at the Syracuse Fair in 1849, as well as the plow competition. A Ferris type wheel graced the 1849 State Fair atop James Street Hill. It may have been the first such contraption in the United States. It was 50 feet high and was hand powered using a system of ropes. Opening day of the fair at its permanent location in the town of Gaddis was September 11, 1890. It was 60 degrees and a month's worth of rain fell in 36 hours. Here is a photo of the main gate from the other side looking towards the boulevard. Visitors were greeted with a beautiful, lush garden. The D, L, and W fares were 10 cents each way or round trip for 15 cents. At the 1890 fair, a Mr. Anderson, who was a commercial fisherman, chanced upon a beached whale along the New Jersey coast. He saw the opportunity to make a fortune and quickly put together a corporation which bought 40 barrels of embalming fluid. Next came the task of loading the whale carcass onto a barge where it was immersed in the embalming fluid. It was brought up to a reasonably sanitary condition, so to speak. From New Jersey, the whale of a show journeyed up and down the waterways of the Northeast, eventually arriving in Syracuse, just in time for the fair, which was located within several hundred yards of the Erie Canal, which was right behind the fairgrounds. 
The odor of the summer after a summer of travel was not in keeping with the fair's decorum, but the whale became a nearby sideshow and did a roaring business. Another story came from the 1893 fair when a young woman from Manlius was inspecting the rooster exhibit. She bent over a cage to get a better look at a strutting white leghorn with <clears throat> a quick motion, the rooster snapped at her ear and down the gullet went the diamond earring. The lady screamed. The owner rushed over, as he explained later, to decapitate the rooster who serviced a large harem for a mere diamond or two. It would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. So we bought the other stone too and fed it to the bird the following noon before an appreciative crowd attracted by appropriate advertising. <clears throat> One of the appeals of the fair was the food vendors. Concessions sold nuts, bananas, oysters, cider, bottled drinks, tobacco and cigars, peaches, Coney Island sausages, grapes and popcorn. Other concessions open shops for selling eyeglasses, decorative china, wire jewelry, glass blowing and engraving and nickel in the slot machines. A Syracuse specialty was the salty potato, which was most likely developed by the city's salt industry, where workers servicing the huge kettles would drop the tiny potatoes into boiling brine. Once the heavy frosting of salt coated the outer skin of the spud, it would split open, then treated with a thick dollop of butter. It's been a hit in Syracuse ever since. <clears throat> Fairgoers love seeing thrills at the fair, such as this fire diver. A man set on fire dives into a pool of water. This poor pony was made to dive into a pool with a rider on his back. The human cannonball where a man was shot out of a cannon. However, the spring release in the cannon failed to project his body into the safety net and he fell to the ground, landing him in the hospital instead. As he recovered, his brother took over the show the next day. In 1905, the airship made its appearance at the State Fair. Bicycle pedals controlled the machine. People watched in amazement as a how a man could fly. And another airship photo with large crowds watching. Being an agricultural fair, farmers took interest in innovations that could make their work easier, such as the steam engine. The fair was a great way for companies to show the latest technology and make sales to the masses. Pace engines advertised to be the only reliable hill climber. Horses and oxen were surely happy for the invention of the tractor. Although the fair had a few wooden buildings and many tents in the early days, they often leaked and the tents would collapse. If the fair wanted to continue to grow and succeed, new buildings would need to be erected. The temporary buildings here, from the left to the right, we have the poultry building the Horticulture Hall, the Administrative Building, West Shore Station, the Syracuse Stove Works, an exhibit of Kernan Stoves and Ranges. Today, that's where Chevy Ford is. In 1903, it was obvious that the fair was not doing well. Attendance and exhibitors were down. Deficits were up and there was talk of moving the fair to another city 
as many had expressed an interest in hosting it. What happened next is an amazing example of community collaboration and cooperation that made Syracuse a destination for hundreds of thousands of people. The creation of the Canoe No Carnival brought national attention to the city and cemented the relationship between the State Fair and Syracuse. Up until this time, the fair was a daytime only event and the predominant mode of transportation was horse and buggy. So it was a major effort to travel all the way to Syracuse just for the fair. It became obviously, obviously that there needed to be more incentive for non-locals to make the long trip to Syracuse. Community leaders came up with the idea to have a carnival type entertainment in the evenings to keep visitors in Syracuse and go to the fair the following day or go for multiple days. It was patterned after the New Orleans Mardi Gras. In 1904, for the first time, the fair made a profit. So many people came for the five night spectacle that there weren't enough hotel rooms for everyone. So residents opened their homes to the visitors and rented rooms out. It was a win-win for everyone. 1917 was the last Canoe No Carnival held as the state fair was doing well on its own. By 1907, there was a need for a large domestic building and a hall for machinery so that manufacturers of agricultural implements need not present their exhibits outdoors. So a statewide architectural competition to design a modern environment for the fair was established. It was won by Green and Wicks, a Buffalo firm which claimed that a total outlay of $2 million would be needed to design the buildings. The project would take the next 25 years to complete. The first permanent building built was the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building. It opened in 1908. It's 150 feet wide by 500 feet long and the annexes of 75 feet by 105 feet. It's an impressive building manufactured from white marble that was tooled and finished by hand. It was a popular resting spot to get out of the sun and rest as people went to the fair in their finest clothes. In the early days of the fair, you could see Onondaga Lake from the fairgrounds prior to salve process depositing their waste along the shoreline. Today, the area across from the main gate is the orange parking lot. In this photo, you can see the original main gate on the left-hand side. This photo shows what years of dumping waste product from Salve Process, also known as Ally Chemical, look like. This is the Salve Fairgrounds exit, also known as Exit 7 off Route 690 West. The piers sticking up out of the water were once the foundation of the Syracuse Yacht Club. In 1909, the legislature approved $278,000 for a state institutions and dairy building connected by a colony. Today, you can go in this building and get yourself a cup of milk or an ice cream cone. You can go to the other end and you'll see fish swimming in tanks and impressive deer mounts. The 400 stall horse barn was built by the racetrack and was completed in 1909. The dairy cattle building opened in 1915 at a cost of $200,000.
The building has room for 928 animals. The dairy building is 362 feet long and 286 feet wide. Here's a photo of the construction of the poultry building, which opened in 1913. The interior of the poultry building looks the same back then as it does today. The newly formed New York State Police appeared at the 1917 State Fair. They kept the fair orderly and patrolled the grounds. The policemen kept everything in good condition, handled traffic, and kept the grounds free of crooks. The troopers saw a man leaving the grounds with an automobile. They had reason to suspect that it wasn't his and gave chase with their horses. The man abandoned the automobile. A couple of hours later, an Ithaca man reported his automobile stolen. The state troopers informed him they had his vehicle. This is also the same year that the first two new horse barns were built up by the boulevard, which can be seen in the very right hand corner of this photo. By the way, the state troopers were formed in Fayetteville, New York. A highlight of the fair for many is to go in and see the sows with their piglets. The swine and goat barn opened in 1922. In 1923, the Coliseum opened at a cost of half a million dollars. And another view of the Coliseum. 1928, the Whittaker Agricultural Museum opened. A log cabin from Schoharie County was carefully dismantled <clears throat> and reassembled in the museum, giving visitors a glimpse of what life was like in pioneer times. The museum also held old tools and farm implements used by the pioneers. In 1928, the Indian village opened. It is actually considered a reservation, which is why when you see events at the fairgrounds, you never see it being used other than during the state fair. It was dedicated by New York Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt. Several bark huts were erected with the entire village planned by Earl Bates with the cooperation of the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. The village includes exhibits <coughs> displaying Iroquois crafts, jewelry, archery, a soap house restaurant, a soup house restaurant and traditional Indian dances are held daily. The Six Nations are the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk in Tuscarora. Nineteen thirty, the youth building opened. In here, you'll find the four H clubs and hatching chicks. The cost for this building was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <throat> Nineteen thirty two, the Harriet Mills Art and Home Building opens. Nineteen thirty seven, both the Horticulture and International Buildings open. The detail in the Horticulture Building brought the price tag for this building to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. 
In here, fruits and berries are on display. The flower show. And vegetables were awarded prizes. The Farm Machinery Building also opened in 1937. That's the building in the lower right-hand corner. It was lost to a fire in 1983. <coughs> in the 1890s, the fair had a half mile racetrack, which was used for most of the events. In 1900, the legislature approved $10,000 for the construction of a one mile track. Here is the horse show in front of the original grandstand that had been built in 1897. It was made entirely of wood. The first grandstand was 140 feet long. The one mile track that was completed in 1900 was one of the few such tracks of its size in the country. Notice the show jumper, no safety equipment needed. Another show jumper. In 1901, a steel grandstand was built next to the original wooden one. The new steel grandstand was 200 feet long and the two together could seat 4,000 people. The grandstand was a multi-use facility during the fair. It's where livestock were shown, horses raced, and bands played. The horse shows and carriage competitions rivaled those of Madison Square Garden. A beautiful set of carriage horses in competition. Alfred Vanderbilt and his prize winning team. His team of horses were brought up from New York City aboard trains. Here is an earlier photo of the Vanderbilt announcing to everyone they've arrived. Note the bag of golf clubs on the back of the carriage on the right hand side. To the west of the grandstand, a commissioner's clubhouse was built. This is where the fair commissioner lived during the fair, as well as notable guests were entertained. <coughs> Cattle competition in front of the grandstand. People would come from around the globe to watch the million dollar mile of cattle to see the world's finest. All lined up around the track, the cattle were worth $1 million. The parade of prized cattle. Cattle came from every state in the country and spectators came from 40 countries. A third grandstand was built in 1906 of architecture similar to the previously built steel grandstand. This new structure, including earlier stands, made the entire structures 562 feet long capable of seating 7,000 spectators.
The newest seating, track, and accommodations for racehorses and livestock cost $51,000. The grandstand had an up-to-date restaurant and modern lavatory. Harness racing lasted until 1951. On June 19, 1942, a severe storm with strong winds lasting 12 minutes ripped off the roof of the grandstand, leveling the seating. It would be rebuilt and the last grandstand was built in 1973 with seating for 15,000 spectators. That was torn down on January 9, 2016. In all, there were five grandstands over the years that I could find. <coughs> Harness racing returned in 1964 with two of the richest races ever held in the world with a purse reaching $285,000. The harvester with a record of 2.01 minutes was the champion trotting stallion of the world when it appeared at the New York State Fair. The two fastest horses in the world, the Harvester and the Hulan, and their famous driver at one of the New York State Fairs. In 1919, the fair had 10, 20, and 50 mile motorcycle races. <coughs> Nineteen eleven car races were fifty miles. Notice how the spectators are lined right up against the guardrails. In this very race at the nineteen eleven State Fair, Lee Oldfield, who was in the lead for a few laps was pumping gas with one hand while he steered with the other when he came to the first turn. Instead of shutting off his engine and coasting around, he continued ahead. He swung out wide for the turn and a tire blew. He crashed through the wooden fence, killing 11 people. This photo is believed to be Lee Oldfield sitting on the fence where his car went through. Car races would not be held for another eight years. When racing resumed, safety measures were taken, taken keeping spectators farther back. Later, steel guardrails were installed. <clears throat> the biplane makes an appearance at the 1910 State Fair. Mr. McCurdy attracted 8,000 people to the grandstand as he flew his Curtis biplane three times around the area at a height of 200 feet. It was deemed one of the largest drawing cards ever. In 1912, they held aeroplane races above the one mile track. Three planes flew 10 times around. Two were Curtis biplanes and one a Thomas Racer. The Thomas Racer won in 10 minutes and 42 seconds. A few years later, barnstormers flew from fair to fair to put on aerial exhibitions and take passengers up for a couple of dollars. Barnstormers made very good money, but took big risks. In September 1920, Tex McLaughlin thrilled the crowds with his daring acrobatic feats. His mother came to the Syracuse State Fair to proudly watch her son perform according to newspaper accounts. Believed when he finished, she would be the first to greet him.
On the last day of the state fair, while descending a ladder to get from one plane to another, Tex clipped one of the propellers of one of the planes. The pilot made an emergency landing in a field owned by my family, which is half a mile from the fairgrounds on what is now Pope's Grove Golf Course. Tex was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. This photo shows my grandfather, second from left, Walter Pope, his siblings and my great-grandmother, Mary Ann Pope, in front of Tex's plane, holding the ladder that Tex used during the stunt. Here is a topiary cannon made out of flowers in 1910. The back of the photo is labeled with the name of Olive. She was able to take home a souvenir to show her friends. Two couples sat for a photo at the 1905 State Fair. Don't you just love the ladies' hats? The big cheese on its way to the 1913 State Fair from Lowville. <clears throat> it weighed 6,500 pounds. A specially built truck was needed to carry the 1921 big cheese, which weighed 12 tons. It too was from Lowville. And yet more cheese headed to the 1929 State Fair, another six tons of cheese. It says that 130,000 pounds of milk were used or an entire day's production of 6,000 cows. Once at the State Fair, the cheese would be cut up and sold off. In 1917 and 1918, the fairgrounds was used to train soldiers for World War I. The war started in 1914, but the United States did not enter the war until April 6, 1917. <laughs> 30 to 40,000 men were trained at Camp Syracuse before being sent to France or other military installations. The camp started out at the fairgrounds, but soon ran out of room, so land in Lakeland was also used to house and train the troops. The camp was the largest mobilization camp in the country during World War I. The fair remained open during the war. Fairgoers were encouraged to buy Liberty Bonds and war stamps, and the soldiers performed maneuvers in front of the grandstand every afternoon for the state fair crowds. 10,000 horses and mules were brought in for use by the Army. Draft horses were used by the field artillery and lighter horses and mules for the ambulances and to carry packs and ammunition. World War I ended on November 11, 1918 with a ceasefire. The Treaty of Versailles was signed June 28, 1919. There's the entrance to the fairgrounds behind the soldiers. By the 1930s, they installed a new main gate showing the advancements in agriculture. the 1930s fairgrounds. State Fair Boulevard is the line of trees to the right in this photo. It was planted with elm trees that were planted by the Smith and Powell farm, original owners of the property. Homes and businesses lined the street next to the fairgrounds. And another aerial taken over Helcom steel, also known as crucible steel, 
showing a 1930s aerial of the fairground. This beautiful building was the State Fair Hotel, which was located across the street from the main gate of the fairgrounds on State Fair Boulevard. It had 40 rooms and was built in the early 1890s. On September 11, 1911, it burned to the ground as the result of a chimney fire. It was insured for $5,000 and was rebuilt a short time later. <clears throat> Which brings me to this next photo taken on Thanksgiving Day, 1943. The Salve Process waste bed that was between the fairgrounds and Onondaga Lake broke open and flooded the homes and businesses, as well as the fairgrounds with up to eight feet of wine. In this photo, you can see the section of the waste bed that gave way. In the lower left corner, you can see the State Fair Hotel. The rows of elm trees line State Fair Boulevard. Looking west through the elm trees and State Fair Boulevard, you can see the State Fair Hotel on the right. The white on the trees marks the height of the waste. The white is not snow, but the lime, which was waste product from making soda ash. Soda ash has many uses, including making glass. <clears throat> Here's a car floating in the sludge in front of Susco's garage. A bulldozer and boat were used to get trapped families and animals from their homes and barns. Homes were knocked off their foundations by the weight of the sludge. Another view of the section that gave way in the homes and businesses across from the fairgrounds. This is the cattle barn and the sec shows the section that gave way right across from it. December 7th, 1941, United States enters World War II following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The fairgrounds from April 1943 to December 1946 was known as the 848th Army Air Force Specialized Depot, which was an annex to the Rome Air Force Base. It was World War II and the threat of possible invasion from the air became apparent. <clears throat> it was decided to not keep supplies centralized in one location, so establishing depots for war supplies at geographical locations was necessary and the fairgrounds were an ideal location. Airplane parts were kept in various buildings around the fairgrounds. The first train car load of supplies came on April 22nd, 1942, and consisted of Ford built Pratt and Whitney engines. Up until the end of 1943, all airplane parts had to be scrapped because they were contaminated with the sludge which had engulfed the fairgrounds. During World War II, the state fair was not held. Even after the war ended, there was no state fair in 1947 because the fair needed major improvements. 267 acres had been used by the army and 16 covered buildings to store material. Government officials were unsure if the fair would ever reopen at its present location. Here's a map of Mattydale. There is much talk that a new state fair should be built in Mattydale near the new Syracuse airport, as it could attract air shows, and with air shows, there could become 
aircraft manufacturers. The arrow to the right shows where the State Fair wanted to locate the new year-round exhibition just below the airport. Four reasons for a new fair included the deterioration of the present fairgrounds, the impossibility of expansion, danger of another waste bed break, and inadequacy of present roads for fair-generated traffic. Keep in mind that Route 690 had not been built yet and Stateford Boulevard and Bridge Street in Salve were the only two roads going to the fair for thousands of cars. Maddydale was sounding pretty good and the new throughway would soon be going in that could handle large amounts of traffic. Here's a view of the proposed new layout. <clears throat> it was estimated that 50 $500,000 would be needed to update the fairgrounds. Um, the electric and telephone wiring had to be replaced as well as all the sewer and plumbing. There were cracks in the brick buildings, arches were shaggy, sagging, and the cornices crumbling in some of the other buildings. This photo here of the proposed new fairgrounds show that A would be the stadium, B would be the Notorium, C would be the Sports Arena, D would be the Theater, E would be a theme building, F would be the Agriculture and Conservation Building, G would be the Trade, Transportation and Science Building, H the Entrance Building, I, the livestock building. K would be a zoo. L would be a music shell and outdoor theater. M would be the aquarium. O, the farm implements building. P, the lagoon. Q, the grandstand. R, the racetrack. J, the women's building, and the home economics building. There would also be a half mile, one mile, and two mile racetracks. Acid in the grounds from the waste bed break had eaten into the pipes at the state fairgrounds and the conduits of the sewer and lighting systems throughout the fairgrounds. The acid eats away at iron and brick. The sludge made it necessary to remove 383 trees from the fairgrounds. In the end, the present location prevailed thanks to the fact that the state lacked the $50 million that it would need build a new fairgrounds in Maddydale. The state spent the $500,000 to fix up the fairgrounds and a limited six-day fair resumed in 1948. Here's another photo of the railroad tracks that the Army laid out going to one of the buildings that needed to be removed and the overgrown brush. By the time the 1949 fair came around, people were eager to resume a normal way of life and the fair had overwhelming crowds. This is downtown Syracuse. The buses would take fairgoers every five minutes to the fair. They couldn't keep up. endless rows of cars going to the state fairgrounds. The elm trees to the right show State Fair Boulevard. Here's West Genesee Street, Down City, cars headed to the state fair and bottle jam. 
And here's Hiawatha Boulevard and State Fair Boulevard. People just park their cars and walk all the way from Hiawatha Boulevard to get to the State Fair. Another nice aerial photo of a jam-packed 1939, 1949 State Fair. If you would like more information on the history of the State Fair, Henry Schramm wrote a wonderful book entitled The Empire Showcase, The History of the New York State Fair. You can also get additional information from the Onondaga Historical Association Research Center, as well as newspaperarchive.com. The Salve Geddes Historical Society also has a large selection of photos to browse through. Thank you.